Hi everyone, I'm Lucy, if you didn't get that. Um, I'd like to preface this talk really quick by apologizing to both of my parents here, my mom and my dad. Um, it'll be a little bit il illuminating for you. <laughs> anyway, we'll hop straight into it. I'm a highly anxious person. I always have been and probably always will be. And I'm also a procrastinator. A really good one at that, too. In fact, I'm such a good procrastinator, I wonder how I haven't failed out of this high school yet. These two personality traits, in a uniquely stressful school and a uniquely stressful decade to be a teenager, make everything slightly harder, slightly more confusing, and a lot more complicated. See, as a person with anxiety, who also procrastinates, I get anxiety about my procrastination. And suddenly, I'm procrastinating more, which makes me more anxious, and I'm stuck in this dangerous loop, just constantly, over and over. Now, basis doesn't make this any easier. There are unspoken standards for every student to be the best to take the most extracurriculars, take the most APs, and get all straight A's. See, I'm taking four APs this year, and I'm gearing up for next year where I'll take about six. I also joined school volleyball, play club volleyball, and I joined the tennis club. And yet I shamed myself for only joining one club and playing one sport and taking four APs when I had friends who were taking six or playing two sports or taking six APs. Now, social media doesn't make this any easier. It glorifies the best parts of people's lives. It always seemed like my friends were on vacation or at the gym or doing better than me, simply. Everyone around me seems like they were better than me. Now, this is where my procrastination steps in. I would put off writing a paper or uh, posting on Instagram even because I was worried that I would write either the world's worst paper or that my friends would think I was just absolutely ugly. Now this reached a peak in the ninth grade. My anxiety was making it so that I wasn't starting homework until 11 p.m. and going to bed around 3 a.m. Uh, now I was getting, at most, three and a half hours of sleep every night. And so when I came home from school at 5 p.m., I would crash, often napping, until 9 p.m. Here we have a day where you can see I took a nap at around 7 p.m. and woke up around 11.15. Thank you to Fitbit. <laughs> That's how I got all my statistics. Then you can see this is uh, 5.36 a.m. bedtime. I woke up at 7.40. That's two hours of sleep. Um, this one particularly makes me laugh because I love the little on target for my makeup time. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's fantastic. I mean, on time wake up time, that's great, you know. Going to bed at 4.30, not so great. But at least I woke up on time, right? Here are some more stats from that. You can see this is another 4.30 a.m. bedtime. And then on the weekends, uh, I was getting about 13, 15 hours of sleep. This is from a Friday to Saturday night. I had gone to bed at 6 p.m. and woken up at 9 a.m. Saturday morning. Um, now that's just fantastic. I mean, I love sleep, but that definitely isn't healthy. See, as this reached a peak and I continued this dangerous cycle, my physical health went in the trash. I got terrible headaches. I was nauseous all the time. My stomach always hurt. My weight fluctuated. My thoughts were foggy and my acne reached an all-time high. In March, I got bronchitis that lasted until April. My body had no energy to fight off the infection. And I managed to hide all this pretty well because my grades stayed up and even increased. That only served as positive reinforcement that what I was doing to myself was okay. Now, I noticed this wasn't healthy. My friends were talking about going to bed at 11 p.m. as being late for them. And I was like, oh, okay, we probably shouldn't get into this conversation then. Um, and so I started going to therapy. Now, when people hear this, they act like I've said the name Voldemort. They seem embarrassed for me. They're like, ooh, okay. Like, it's awkward for them, for me, to talk about my personal experience with it. I see it as healthy. It gives me a nice place to bend my stress without having to put it all on my friends. And to me, it's just like going to the dentist or the doctor. Now, when people of an older generation hear this, they sometimes can either say, get over it, or I considered myself depressed when I was your age, and I grew out of it. Now, to that, I say, Okay. <laughs> now, in a study referenced by the National Alliance on Mental Illness, 16.5% of U.S. youth aged 6 years old to 17 experienced a mental health disorder in 2016. 16.5%. That is 7.7 .7 million people 
in the United States alone from 6 to 17 that are suffering from a mental health disorder. Now that is double the population of people that live in Los Angeles, which is the United States' second largest city. Um, and that is just a mind-blowing mind statistic. Here are some other ones. Also, in a study done by the UCLA in 2016, 62% of college freshmen in 2016 said that they felt overwhelmed by all that they had to do. Now, comparatively, in 1985, only 18% of college freshmen said that they felt that way. Mental illness is on the rise, and the facts do not work. Now, while social media does play a role in this, like I mentioned earlier, it can reinforce toxic standards of beauty and glorify the best parts of people's lives, it definitely isn't my biggest trigger for anxiety. For me, it's grades in college, personally. Now, from a young age, it's been ingrained in most of my generation that the only way to be successful is to go to college. Now great, we need to get there first. Oh, and you're only successful if you go to a name brand school that has a flashy reputation and supposedly better academics. Well okay, now we need to get there. Oh, and you can only get into said school if you have a 4.0, 26 extracurriculars, including four sports and seven different arts, start six charities, and get perfect scores on every standardized test you ever take. Well, crap, now I gotta do that too. Oh, and to top it all off, admissions to these schools for four years will put you in six figures of student debt. How's that sound? This is the image that we're given. And maybe, just maybe, if we work hard enough, if we only work on school for four years straight and take every single opportunity available to broaden our horizon, we have a 6% chance or less of attending these institutions, let alone paying for them. Now this. This is what gives me my anxiety. Recognizing that was hard at first. At first, I wanted to play it off as me being more competitive or caring more than others. But when I was sobbing over a 90% in a physics class, or crying myself to sleep at night because of a grade, I definitely knew that it wasn't healthy. I have distinct memories of me vomiting the night before the ACT and staying up until 4 a.m. to study, because in my mind, I just wasn't good enough. I broke out in stress highs the day of my first chem final because I was just that nervous about it. I was coming home from school every day and screaming and crying into my pillow because I was just that insecure about who I was and my grades. Now, this was really hard for me to notice at first. As I said, I just wanted it to be that I was more competitive and I wanted it to be something about me that I couldn't change. I just wanted it to be like, oh hey, that's Lucy, the one who was destroying herself for her grades. But I definitely knew that I needed to change it. And so, as I said, I started working on myself. At first with the help of friends, then going to therapy, as I mentioned, and lastly, I started keeping a journal. I kept a simple journal, just one where I tracked my different feelings throughout different days. Whether I was happy, sad, anxious, nervous, whatever. And I noticed, after reading through that towards the end of the year, that I procrastinated almost every single day where I felt anxious. I procrastinated heavily the night before big things were due, like a language research paper or a Latin project. I was putting it off because I was so nervous about a grade that wasn't even in the grade book yet. And then, looking at the journal more closely, I realized that every time I was happy, it also stemmed from a grade. I was happy about a 96 I got on the test. I was happy that I had gotten an A on a project. I was happy that my trimester three grade report had come back and it wasn't absolutely terrible. My anger also came from my grades. I was angry about an 89 because it made me feel stupid. I was angry about that 89 because the friend that I had studied with had done better than me on that test. And so, looking at that, looking at my anger towards myself, I realized that yes, some of it was deeply seated anger but a lot of it stemmed from my anxiety. See, was I actually really angry about that 89, or was I nervous about it? And the truth is, I was nervous about it. I was worried about that 89 because what if it brought my class grade down to a 92? The horror, I know, which then brought my GPA down to 3.96, and that wasn't a 4.0. And imagine the horror of my college application not having a 4.0 on it. I know, it's terrible. But I always pictured that 3.96 as being the thing that kept me from getting into the college I really wanted to attend. Now, that premise is a little sillier to me now. I will admit that sometimes it still gets the best of me. But I noticed that this is ridiculous. These stats are ridiculous. 
in the, my grades don't define who I am. Now, after reading these, looking at my journal, talking to my therapist, I decided that for my sophomore year, I would always try and put myself first. Yeah, I could have stayed up until, you know, 2 a.m. studying for that test, but I know that I definitely need the sleep to do as well as I want to on it, so I'm going to go to sleep. Or yeah, I could have stayed home and made a study guide or done my math homework, but my friends really want to go play mini golf, so I'm going to go play mini golf. As I started doing this, as I started working on myself, I noticed that my mental and physical health were better. I was getting less headaches, a cold wasn't sticking around for a month and a half, and I was just generally feeling better about who I was. I was getting better at being me, slowly. Now to quote my favorite TED talk, and the personal inspiration for me even joining the TED X club, Perfection is the Wrong Direction by the lovely Isabel Pons, I highly recommend you watch it, being perfect is what's stopping you from being good. I love that quote. My best definitely isn't perfect, and me trying to achieve this unattainable standard of a 100 was simply keeping me from being me. These little changes made the biggest difference, and I didn't even notice it until I had gotten back a particularly embarrassing math um, quiz. I didn't cry, I didn't shake with anxiety, I simply shook off that grain. It was water off my back, it was nothing. This was one of the first times in my career as a basis student and a student in general that I was even able to do something like that. I noticed what I was going through the day that I took that quiz. I was grieving for my grandfather and I was running on two hours of sleep. And as much as that grade will stick around in the grade book and haunt my grade for the rest of trimester two, the culmination of all my hard work becoming actual progress is what I will choose to remember. Thank you.